Andy Pauli and I'm a group leader at the IMP in Vienna. And today I would like to share with you some of our new insights that we have, how an egg develops into an embryo. And this is a particularly interesting question because the egg in any organism actually is made by the mum and it's a huge investment by the mother actually to put in all the energy and the components that are needed for the embryo to develop. So the egg has two main challenges. It needs to preserve the energy and it needs to store the components that the mum has already provided to it in order for the embryo then to develop. So we are studying this problem in our favorite model system, which is the zebrafish embryo. And in the zebrafish embryo, there are about trillions of ribosomes that are put in by the mum into the egg and that are there to make all the proteins that are then needed during embryogenesis for the embryo to develop. And in the zebrafish, this is very specific because these ribosomes are actually there to make all the proteins that are needed for the first 24 hours of an embryo. And that is what you see here in this movie, where the embryo develops over the first 24 hours into a larva that can then already move. And all of this is really driven by these maternally provided ribosomes. What was completely unclear is, however, how are these ribosomes stored in the egg? And that is the question that I would like to talk to you today about. And this was the project from two fantastic lab members, Rita Lesch, a PhD student, and Laura Lorenzo Orts, a postdoc in my lab. So how did we start this project? We initially wanted to know how are the ribosomes actually stored in the egg. And for that, we used a lysate from embryos and from individual oocytes as well and ran them on a sucrose gradient in order to separate them by size. And that allows you to distinguish the polysomes, which are multiple ribosomes bound to an RNA, and the monosomes, which is an individual ribosome that is not bound by an RNA. And for a 24-hour larva, we observed like a regular profile that you would observe from any normally translating cell, that we find many ribosomes are in polysomes, which means they are actively translating, while there is a subset of ribosomes that are present in monosomes. However, for our egg sample that we analyzed, this looks completely different. So all of the ribosomes we found are only in the monosomes and there are no polysomes present early on. We can quantify this over time, so now each dot is one of these profiles, and you can nicely observe, if you look here at the ratio between polysomes to monosomes, that there is an increase in the number of polysomes compared to the monosomes over time. And that is kind of, for us, a signal that there is an increase in translational activity during embryogenesis. It also means, in addition, that in the egg, we have purely monosomes present and no polysomes yet there. So with that, we kind of knew now that ribosomes are stored as monosomes and not as polysomes in the zebrafish egg. But of course, the big question was, why are there only monosomes if there are trillions of ribosomes already there? Why are they not yet forming polysomes at these early stages? And we next isolated ribosomes in order to analyze now what was going on with these ribosomes. We isolated them from different time points of embryogenesis, and I'm just showing you here one example where we isolated ribosomes from six-hour embryos and from an early time point from this one-hour sample, and analyzed with mass spectrometry which proteins are highly abundant now on these one-hour ribosomes versus on the six-hour ribosome. And this is plotted here as the full change in abundance, and here is just the significance. And all the proteins that I show here on the left side are basically depleted at the later time points at six hours compared to the time point at one hour. So meaning these are highly abundant in the early embryos, but they are depleted at six hours when the ribosomes become actively translating. And this was really interesting because we found that there are three factors that are core translation factors, EF2 and ERF5A. In addition, we found three novel factors that had never really been observed to be bound to the ribosome, and that is HPP4 and these two paralogous proteins, DAP1B and DAP. And I will get a bit more into what we know now about these factors because we got really interested in those. Since we didn't know anything about these new factors particularly, we of course were wondering where are they bound to the ribosome. And for that, we teamed up with David Hasselbach here at the IMP as well and Anton Meinhardt, who are experts in cryo-electron microscopy. And we wanted to use this technology in order to find out where are each of these factors localized on the ribosome. And since you might never have seen 
in cryoEM a ribosome, I would like to orient you first to explain to you what to expect. In a normally translating ribosome, you always have the large subunit of the ribosome, the small subunit of the ribosome, and then there are particularly factors that are bound normally in a translating ribosome. And that is you have an mRNA that is decoded, you have the tRNAs in the individual sites, the A site, the P site, the polypeptidyl transferase site, and the exit site is the E site. And in addition, and that will be very important for my talk, you have this channel which is called the polypeptide exit tunnel, and this is where the nascent polypeptide chain emerges from the ribosome. In our ribosomes that we isolated from these early time points, where we only have monosomes and presumably no active translation, we observed something very different. And I'm showing you this first as a scheme to orient you. So what we observed is we found all four factors that I showed you before in the mass spectrometry analysis. We could localize them to these ribosomes. And what we found is EF2 is bound to this A side of the ribosome. HPP4 is bound where normally the mRNA would bind. EL5A is bound to this E site, the exit site of the ribosome, and then, most importantly probably, is that there is this DAP and DAP1B protein we found inserted into the polypeptide tunnel. In real, the data looks like this. So this is now a map of the zebrafish ribosome that we built with these factors showing you here in surface representation. And there I think it's obvious that this DAP, DAP1B is really inside of the ribosome. It is inserted into the channel. We are super excited about this because such a state of the ribosome that we now call the dormant ribosome state has never been observed. In particular, there has never been a ribosome isolated that has both ELF5A and ELF2 bound to the same particle. However, we have very good evidence that these, all these four factors are actually bound to the same particle. So it's not just that we have different classes of ribosomes, but we have really these are together bound to the same ribosome. And this state of this ribosome that we identified in zebrafish is also present in Xenopus. So when we isolated ribosomes from the Xenopus X, we also found exactly the same four factors bound to the Xenopus X ribosomes. So I would like to now spend a little bit of time to tell you more about this particular factor here, HPP4, and also about this other factor, DAP and DAP1B, because they had never been characterized before. So what do we know about HPP4? HPP4 blocks the mRNA channel that I mentioned already. So it is sitting here exactly at the region where normally in a translating ribosome, the mRNA would be bound. It's bound here to this mRNA channel and it locks EF2 in position. EF2 is a GTPase that would normally come in and out in order to remove tRNAs. However, in this situation, there is no tRNA present on our dormant ribosomes and it is locked in place by a HPP4. From yeast, there is a homolog that is called STEM1. In mammals, there are homologs that are called serpent binding proteins. And these proteins had been already shown to be bound to a very similar position on the ribosome and also in conjunction with EF2B. From yeast, it was also known that this yeast homolog for HPP4 is necessary to preserve the structure of the ribosomes after amino acid starvation. We were therefore hypothesizing that maybe HPP4 might have a similar role in the egg to preserve the ribosomes. And in order to test this, we generated mutants in zebrafish that lack HPP4. These fish are viable and the females laid eggs. However, what we observed is that in our HPP4 mutant females, the eggs that they laid, they had about 30% less total RNA present. And since total RNA is mostly formed by ribosomal RNA, we already hypothesized that this is probably due to a reduction in ribosomes. And indeed, when we isolated, again, ribosomes and analyzed them via our polysome gradients, we found a corresponding decrease in the amount of monosomes, while the amount of polysomes did not change. And so we find, again, this 30% reduction in the number of monosomes, while polysomes is roughly the same. So this tells us that HPP4 in the zebrafish egg is absolutely essential for maintaining and preserving the ribosomes in the egg. What about DAP and DAP1B? So this was a really exciting project that we didn't know initially where these proteins are. These are unstructured short proteins. And it was only during the lockdown period that Frida and Laura, they came to my office and were basically like, we have a problem. There is density in the channel and we knew already that this polypeptide exit tunnel, there shouldn't be anything because these were not actively translating ribosomes. 
When we look closer, we realize that this density is indeed exactly where normally in a translating stalled ribosome, um, the polypeptide exit chain would basically emerge. But in our ribosome, there is the C-terminus of DAP and DAP1B. We can zoom in on this region, which is called the peptidyl transferase center. This is where the new amino acid will be joined to the chain. And what we observe here in the normal, um, from the nascent peptide chain, the C-terminus and the tRNA is at a certain position here within the peptidyl transferase center. Our DAP1B protein basically extends beyond this normal C-terminal site and is very close in proximity to EL5A, which has a modified amino acid at this site, which is called the hypocene. And I will get back to this glutamine in a bit. So this was really interesting. This protein never been observed before on any ribosome. It's called death-associated protein, but we found now that it is inserted in the tunnel. Given that it is inserted in the tunnel and we are thinking of it more like it plucks the ribosome, it's really like a pluck that is inserted there, we hypothesized that it may potentially actually block translation in the egg and, and thereby inhibit the waste of energy that would otherwise occur if ribosomes were actively translating. And to test this directly, because in the zebrafish embryo it's difficult because you have many other factors that would also influence how translation is regulated, we turned to an in vitro system. And in this in vitro system, we were asking the very simple question whether recombinantly produced DAP and DAP1B protein can repress translation in a rapid reticular lysate system. So you have ribosomes that are coming now from a rabbit and you add an mRNA that is the luciferase mRNA in this case, in addition to your recombinant proteins that we would want to test. And we ask how much luminescence is generated via translating this luciferase mRNA. In a control situation where we add just BSA, which shouldn't impede the translation in this rapid reticular lysate system, we find we can add BSA at high concentrations and we still get a high amount of translation, meaning in this case your luminescence, under these conditions when BSA is added. When we, on the other hand, add BAC7, which is our positive control, that is a known translation inhibitor that is inserted into the peptide channel as well. It's a small peptide that binds to the polypeptide exit tunnel. We found that this indeed inhibited efficiently translation at a certain concentration. We were super excited when we realized that DAP1B has exactly the same activity in terms of it blocks translation at a similar range, similar concentration where BAC7 blocks translation. So this was really exciting because it told us that this peptide indeed has the ability to block translation in this in vitro mammalian system. On the other hand, very surprisingly and very unexpectedly, I have to say, is DAP, this other protein that we also found co-purifying with our ribosomes in the egg, in vitro does not have this ability. In mammalian system, DAP cannot block translation while DAP1B does. And you might wonder, I did not show you yet, what is different about these two proteins. And for that, I would like to show you here this amino acid sequence alignment. That is, all vertebrates basically have both DAP and DAP1B. These are clearly paralogous proteins, so they share a high amount of amino acids and are even identical in quite a few amino acids. We know from mass spec crosslinking experiments that the N terminus of both proteins is close to RPL31, which is a ribosomal protein 31 and ribosomal protein 35, which are outside here at the exit tunnel. So this fits with our data, while the C terminus is inserted into the tunnel. They look very similar, and I don't yet have an answer for you what really makes out the difference. What we did notice is that there is here this additional amino acid at the C terminus in all DAP1B proteins that is missing in the DAP proteins. However, when we did the experiment and swapped the C-terminal residue, basically put it on the DAP or deleted this from the DAP1B, that does not explain the difference between these two proteins. We don't yet know. This is an open question that we are still trying to find out what the difference between these two proteins is. However, we do know that it is not a superfish specific thing because we've tested by now also the human DAP and DAP1B homologs and also Xenopus DAP and DAP1B homologs, and they behave exactly like in zebrafish. All the DAP1B proteins that we have tested so far bind and block the ribosome, but none of the DAP proteins can efficiently bind to the ribosome and block it.
Now that we knew that DAP1B has this ability and is sufficient to repress translation on these ribosomes, we were of course wondering what is actually happening now to these rabbit ribosomes in this in vitro system when we add recombinant DAP1B protein. So we were hypothesizing that maybe we can even reconstitute with this very simple system now the full dormant egg ribosome state that we isolated from Xenopus and from zebrafish. And this was indeed the case, so we were really super excited when we got this data. So we performed cryo-EM now from this rabbit reticulolysis system under conditions where we had purely added DAP1B protein. And we found that adding DAP1B protein is sufficient to recruit all other three factors. So meaning we again have our dormant ribosome factors now on this rabbit reticulolysis system. There's one new factor that I haven't yet mentioned. So in rabbit reticulolysis systems, you don't have happy before because that is an oocyte specific protein. However, I mentioned this homolog for happy before, which is called serpent binding protein in mammals that is present at high abundance in this rabbit reticulolysis system. And that we found it recruited in this mRNA channel in this rabbit system. So what we think to summarize, is we have actually two modules that form our dormant egg ribosome states. The module one is formed by serpent binding protein or HPP4 in the egg and EF2. And this module is essential to stabilize the ribosomes in the state of the monosomes. The other module is the module two and this module is formed by DAP1B and ER5A, and this is essential to repress translation of these ribosomes that would otherwise be actively translating. Of course, there are many questions that are now opening up, so we don't yet have answers to all of them, and we actually have generated, I think, more questions almost than we have answered. So one interesting thing is, of course, you have now this dormant egg ribosome in the egg, but we know that these ribosomes here need to become actively translating when you transition to an embryo. So all of these factors here need to be released. And we are very interested in finding out how is this release actually regulated? What is the triggering factor? Is it a signal? The other interesting aspect is two of these factors that I kind of didn't talk much about, EF5A and EF2, are core translation factors. So these factors are absolutely essential for any translation cycle. Any amino acid that is added to a protein requires these factors to be in place. And we think that the fact that this egg ribosome contains these core translation factors packaged together with a ribosome is actually a really neat system that the egg has developed here in order to not only pass on the ribosomes, but also the essential core translation factors. Of course, another interesting question is whether these factors, the ones that are now specific in the egg, HPP4 and DAP1B, whether they may also have functions outside of the egg context in other cell types, for example, where they may also be needed to store these ribosomes or preserve them for prolonged periods of time to be ready to go when they are needed. So overall, this is kind of the story that I wanted to tell you. So I think we have discovered here a really interesting mechanism, completely new. No one had thought that there would be still something new to be discovered on the ribosome that people have studied already for such a long time. But I think we showed that we have discovered here this dormant ribosome state that is new. It is present in the egg and it is conserved at least in zebrafish and in Xenopus. And it is there to preserve the energy that the mum put in in order to store all the components in the egg. And with that, I would like to thank my whole lab. It's really a fantastic team. I think I highlighted the key people that worked on it, Frida and Laura and Karina actually performed all the in vitro translation experiments then this would have been absolutely impossible to do without this amazing kind of collaborations that we had on campus, particularly with David Hasselbach's lab, but also with help from Anton Meinhardt's Young for the Xenopus, and also the Maspec facility was absolutely instrumental for the success of this project. And then of course, all the services on campus and on site and funding sources. And I'm thanking you for all of your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.